Today we're going to be in Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Um, if you know me, you know that typically I take books of the Bible and preach through them. Next week we will be starting a new series with a new book of the Bible. Um, but I want to take today to just to kind of gear us up for what we're doing over this next year. It's kind of a little bit of a tradition for pastors when it gets to a new year to kind of set the stage and cast vision. Uh, you know, where are we going? What are we doing? Uh, what are we all about? And with that, I'll just say this. I've appreciated several of the conversations I've had over the last season with different people in our church who have been concerned because we have been given the gift of a building and a property. And uh, you might be saying, concerned? Why would someone be concerned for that? Because it is so easy for churches to get off track. And a lot of times when churches get into building projects, everything becomes about the building. When Camel and I were young, um, we uh, spent time in Bend, Oregon at a church plant, and it was amazing just to see this church start and literally within a year um, bought property and built a church. It was one of these deals where uh, almost the entire church was built in three days. People from all over Oregon, Washington, and Idaho showed up on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and foundation was already poured, but they put walls up, roof, um, just did almost everything. Everything but the carpet was done, pretty much, in three days. And uh, this pastor at this church plant had worked so hard in that year to get a church building, but after that was done, they just floundered. And within like three years, the church was dead because the vision was only about the building. At Christ the King, our passion, our mission, our, our burning desire is to know God more and to make him known to more people. So what are we doing in 2023? Exactly what we did in 2022, but more of it and better. All right? More of it and better. So our passion, our desire, our mission is not changing at all. This year is going to be a year where we're going to try to dig deeper. We want to know God more and to make him known to more people as we're on this journey of life. And uh, Psalm 84 is uh, one of my favorite uh, chapters in the entire Bible. It, it is my favorite psalm. Um, and, uh, you know, how many of you, just out of curiosity, have ever heard me preach out of Psalm 84? Raise your hand. Okay, my kids are like, oh yeah, we've heard so many sermons out of Psalm 84. Um, once I get into it, you guys, some of you who have been around CTK for a long time will be like, oh yeah, I know this one. I, I probably preach on it once a year, okay? And it just happens that it's, it's falling at the beginning of the year, but this passage means so much to me. And let me set the stage for this. This is a song written by a pilgrim. What do I mean by a pilgrim? I know, uh, you know, as soon as I hear that word, I instantly think of, uh, you know, uh, Puritans with funny hats and, uh, you know, uh, guns running around shooting turkeys. That's kind of what I think of with pilgrim. But the idea of a pilgrim is somebody who is on a journey with a destination in mind, okay? And this is a Jewish person who is on a pilgrimage. And I want to just put out there three different questions as we look at this passage. One, what is he looking for? Two, how badly does he want it? And three, why does he want it? The first one, what is he looking for? Second, how badly does he want it? And third, why does he want it? This is what we read. Psalm 84 at verse 1. To the choir master, according to the Giddeth, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, 
Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Selah. Let's stop there. That Selah that you see on there is a Hebrew term, and um, it's a little bit confusing as far as what that means exactly, but um, what scholars say is it's meant to be something as you're reading a psalm and you see that, that you stop and you meditate, you dwell on what was just said, all right? So the first question was, what is this pilgrim looking for? And we find it in verse one. How lovely is your dwelling place, or Lord of, Lord of hosts? This is a pilgrim who is in Israel, who is traveling to the dwelling place of the Lord. Now, usually when this is taught, people will present it in a way, because this is a psalm of the sons of Korah that was sung <clears throat> in the temple in Jerusalem, that this is a pilgrim traveling to Jerusalem, to the temple. I'm just going to drink coffee this entire time. <clears throat> and forgive me for clearing my throat as much. <clears throat> hey, Megan, let's play a game today, okay? Megan's on sound. Every time you see me go like this, <clears throat> see how fast you can mute me to cover that cough, okay? <laughs> let's try it out right now. Ready? <laughs> let's try it. Ready? And uh, while I'm talking, I'll... all right, thank you very much. Yeah, there you go, right there. <laughs> Keeping it real at Christ the King. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, you missed it that time. <laughs> oh, boy, this is going to turn out more like junior high group than a sermon, I think. Um, notice that the psalmist says this, how lovely is your dwelling place. Now, the assumption there is that we're talking about the temple in Jerusalem. But in Hebrew, that word is not temple. That is a word that literally means a place to dwell. It can describe um, a shepherd's hut every once in a while. More likely, it describes a tent. And almost every single time in the Old Testament, it's not talking about a tent or a shepherd's hut, it's talking about the tabernacle of God. That word right there, dwelling place, is tabernacle. How lovely is your tabernacle, your tent, your shepherd's hut, the place where God's present dwelt. So this psalmist is on a pilgrimage and the thing that he is looking for isn't simply just a big, majestic building that was beautiful on the temple mount, the big temple. He is looking for the tabernacle, a tent, which was the dwelling place of God, where God's Shekinah glory was, God's literal, tangible presence. When we talk about the glory of God, Understand that that is his tangible presence. God in his character is omnipresent, meaning he is everywhere. There is no place you can go in creation where God is not. If I walk to that side of the stage, he's there. If I walk to that side of the stage, he's there. If I walk out to the men's restrooms way out yonder, he's there. When I go home, he is there. When I go to downtown Portland, believe it or not, he is there. But what we find in Scripture is sometimes God manifests his presence in a way that is tangible. You actually experience God in some way, shape, or form. It might be through a burning bush. It might be through a storm or a still, small voice. But 
within the tabernacle of the Lord, the tent of meeting that was built during the Exodus, God's Shekinah glory, his tangible presence was there. And what this pilgrim is seeking isn't just a building. He wants God. He wants to know him, to be in his presence. And I think that's so important for us to grab a hold of. Our mission statement in our church, we want to know God more. Do we really know him? Or do we know about him? Are we around him? Or are we around things that are kind of like him? Those are two very different things. It is entirely possible to know about God, but to not actually know him, to walk and talk with him. And that is the desire of this pilgrim. I want to be in the place, Lord, where your physical, tangible presence is. It's not enough for me to know you from afar. I want to be with you. I love that. This place is known for God's presence, so he's going there. Um, it makes me think of an argument that's ongoing in my family. Two of my grandsons um, are four, and they constantly talk about Papa's house. So last night, one of my grandsons, Theo, was in our back seat, and we started to pull into the driveway, and instantly Theo says, we're at Papa's house. And the argument started because my wife said, I live here too. <laughs> and he said, no, this is Papa's house. And she said, it's Nana's house. And it went back and forth, back and forth, until finally I just looked at him and I said, it's Papa's house, <laughs> right? Why do they call it Papa's house? Because they know when they go there that their Papa's going to be there. They know that if Papa is awake, he will run out to the porch and give him big hugs. They know that Papa's asleep and they get there. They can run in and jump on him and wake him up. They know that when they get there, the first thing Papa's going to do is go straight to the pantry and pull out the candy. They know that they're going to get to have pillow fights, jump on things. They're going to be with their papa and experience him. That's what the pilgrim is looking for. And how badly does he want to know God? Don't let this slide by. Verse 2 is so important. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Think about that. He wants to be in the Lord's presence so much that his soul, his inward being, is like fainting to try to get there. I like to be in the presence of the Lord. I like to be with God's people and, and sing praises because the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Saturday nights are the worst night of the week for me where I don't get sleep because I'm excited to get to church the next day. Uh, when, I, when I get up and I get ready on a Sunday morning, I'm like, I can't wait to get to church. I, I want to sing praises with God's people. I, I want to be here. I want to uh, pray together. I want to experience the Lord. And yet, I have never been at the point where I am literally fainting because my soul so badly wants to be with the Lord. Think about that. I was trying to think about this this past week, and what came to mind was all the old videos, videos, the old movies of teenage girls at the Beatles concerts. <laughs> think about that. That is what he is describing here. Literally to the point where he's so excited to be with the Lord that he can't contain it. And it's not just inward, it is literally his flesh. My heart 
and my flesh are singing out to joy for the living God. The living God. The God who is active, alive, and part of this world. Here is the description of a man who wants to know God more, to know him in greater ways, to experience him in the ways he's experienced him before and in new, fresh ways. Is that us? Is that us? What does he want? He wants God. How badly does he want it? To the point where his soul longs, yes, even faints, just to get in God's presence. And why does he want it? Well, let's go back to verse 3 and let's move through this. He's going to describe several different things. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Now notice this in verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. There are going to be three times in this psalm where the psalmist says that followers of God will be blessed. And the first one is this, verse 4. We are blessed when we dwell in the house of God, ever singing praise. Um, it is interesting, too, uh, if you take that word and the way that they put it over into Greek, a lot of you know that word from the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek. But some old translations of the Beatitudes don't say blessed. What do they say? Happy. Happy. And it can mean either. It can mean either. You want to have a fulfilled life? You want to be blessed by the Lord? You want to be happy? Be in the Lord's house. Always singing his praise. Do you come on a Sunday morning ready to praise him? I, I, I don't know about you, but it's what I love to do. Like I said earlier, I can't hear. And I was like, all right, I don't care. I'm just going to belt it out. I don't know if I'm on pitch or not. I just want to sing to the Lord. Can I say this? Men, real men sing. Real men sing. Um, when you look at the manliest man in the Bible, who is it? King David. All right, yeah, okay. Some of you are like, no, it's Jesus. All right. Take Jesus out. King David, right? King David. He's described as having arms the size of cedar trees. Huh? He, 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 he defeated uh, uh, Goliath with a stone. Then what did he do? He took his huge sword, hacked his head off, and ran around with this huge sword in one hand and this giant head in the other. The songs that were sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And yet, what one person wrote most of the Psalms, King David, who sang to the Lord, oh, praise the Lord. Verse 5 goes on, and we get the second blessed statement. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. He is talking now as he is journeying through life, he is on his way to get to the Lord, and it is a long journey, and he is finding his strength to journey to the Lord's presence from the Lord himself. Blessed are those who are on this journey, and they find their strength in you, God, in whose heart are the highways of Zion. He's describing this, that uh, even the journey to get there, no, long, no matter how long it takes, no matter if it's uphill, downhill, twisty, turny, or straight, these people keep going on this journey to, to find your presence. And they're, they're, they, they love it. Their heart is bent on it, and they find their strength to go about this journey in you. As they go through the Valley of Bacah, 
They make it a place of springs. The early rain also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. As these pilgrims find their strength in God and they are on this long journey, he says that they go through the valley of Baca. And while they're there, it becomes a place of springs. Where's the valley of Baca? We don't know. But the valley of Baca, Baca means tears or weeping. And what he's saying is on this journey as a pilgrim, you're going to go through these deep places in life. They're going to be dry and you're going to have tears. But because your strength is in the Lord, you've set your heart on this highway to get to his presence, to know him more in that place of tears. Those tears will become pools and springs where vegetation and flowers start popping up. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely beautiful. Um, the last time I had double ear infections and was knocked out for 10 days was in January of 2020. January of 2020. Woke up on a New Year's Day. My wife and I both completely sick. Ended up, uh, just felt like we got hit by a truck. Got over that sickness and we thought, all right, over illness, got our big sickness for the year out of the way. Let's head into 2020. How'd that year go? <laughs> you look at the last three years and there's been a lot of turmoil. There's been a lot of, of just bad things happening. And yet, for me, the last three years have been three of the best years of my entire life. Can you say that? Is your heart set on God, on knowing him and being with him so much to the point where you're able to look around and even in the valley of despair, you're seeing God move and your tears become the things that water the ground to produce beauty? That's what happens when you are a pilgrim whose heart is set on the highway that leads to God and you find your strength in him and him alone. Uh, verse 7, he says, they go from strength to strength. The idea is you're at this level of strength, and you've made it this far in the journey, but that strength only carried you so far, and through the Holy Spirit of God and the encouragement of the saints, now you are moving on to a deeper level of strength. It's time to power up. Verse 9, behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed. What we have in the first part of this psalm is this gentleman beginning his journey. In the middle of the psalm, he is in the valley of Baca. He is not yet to the tabernacle. And now what we see is he is now in Jerusalem at this stage of this journey. When it says, behold, our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed, most likely this is taking place when David was the king in Jerusalem and after David had moved the tabernacle to Jerusalem. It was protected. Any pilgrim that wanted to get there did not have to worry about bandits anymore, did not have to worry about Philistines, uh, you know, marauding them on the roads because the anointed king was there to protect those pilgrims. Behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Think about that. Over Christmas, I watched a whole bunch of different Christmas movies and why do so many, it's like Christmas movies either take place at the North Pole or New York City. 
Have you ever noticed that? It's like one or the other. And uh, in so many of them, there's hotels and stuff, and who's always at the door? The doorman. Wears a, a funny little suit, little hat a lot of times, and what's his job? Open the door, close the door. Open the door, close the door. Have any of you at any time in your life ever said to you, man, I think I picked the wrong career. I should have been a doorman at a hotel. Anyone? Good, because I would go down and slap you on the head, right? <laughs> Who thinks that? Nobody does. Nobody says that's my, my goal in life. And yet, look at what he says. One day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would, I would rather be the person at the tabernacle who just opens the door for people than be in the tents of the wicked with, with wealth and just all of these things. Do we think that way? Is our mind on the things of this world and what we can get out of this world, on the vacations we can take, on the houses we can buy, on the boats we can sail, on the guitar that we've always wanted, but my wife won't... Anyways, um, you know, <laughs> what is your heart set on? Or is it, I just want to be in the presence of the Lord. It doesn't matter if I have the most simple task, even that is better than anything else this world can offer. Verse 11, for this Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. That's the third blessing. Blessed is the one who trusts in you. Are we trusting in the Lord today? Is that where our trust is, our faith? Is our strength coming from the Lord or from the things of the world? I look at this and I, I just, I love this song. It means so much to me. The first time that I heard this psalm was when I was in college, and uh, I had to do, it was at Concordia uh, University. Uh, I was doing a, a worship class, and um, my friends thought it would be funny. One day when I was sick, they signed me up to do chapel, and I had to go to chapel and do a Gregorian chant of Psalm 84. What would happen is they would hit a big bell thing, and you'd hear, bong, and then I would have to go, how lovely is your dwelling place, <laughs> bong, oh Lord God Almighty, something like that. I can't, am I on pitch? I can't even tell. <laughs> like kids are like, don't do that again. Yeah, yeah. People watching on online are like, turn it off. <laughs> Yeah, and they thought it, my friends were dying laughing. I was there in a robe doing a Gregorian chant. And afterwards, this really old theologian, I mean really old, like really, really old, um, he came up to me just crying, just crying. And he said, thank you so much. That's my song. I haven't heard it in years, but that meant so much to me. Why? Because here was a man who spent his entire life not only studying about God, but who knew God. And it was a description of his life. Now, we don't have a tabernacle or a temple that we go to to be in the Lord's presence. What do we have? Well, when the tabernacle was built, they anointed it. 
and God's glory came, and there was fire and smoke. So much so that nobody could go in to that tabernacle. And the people of Israel were falling down on their faces, bowing and worshiping the Lord, because in that tabernacle, through fire and smoke, the Lord's presence was known. And for year after year, there was a pillar of smoke by day and fire by night. And that was the Lord's presence. Centuries later, King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. And it was beautiful and majestic and glorious. So much so that all of the region around would see this temple on a hill. And the day it was finished... They prayed over it. They anointed it. And what happened? It was fire and smoke. And it was the Lord's presence filling that temple to the place where nobody could be inside the temple. And on that day in Jerusalem, all of the wealthiest people, all the rich and the powerful in all their fine robes ended up flat on their face on the ground because... The Lord's glory and his holiness, his presence, was there in that temple. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided Tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. They went out and they started declaring the glory of the Lord. And people said, what is this? What is going on? And Peter said, this is what was prophesied about in Joel. This is exactly what was prophesied. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and my female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord's coming, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And they heard these words and many more. And, and people said, oh, what do we do about this? Peter, what do we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. We no longer have a temple or a tabernacle because we are the temple or the tabernacle. That's what took place. His presence, his spirit, now in us. How beautiful. And that's why Paul says in, in, in Ephesians 2, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, the temple being joined together, grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, why do I want to be here with you so badly? Because this is my pilgrimage. 
When we're together, we are in the presence of the Lord. And it's not that we just know about him, it's that we can actually know him. So what are we going to do this year in 2023? Can our prayer be, Lord, we want to know you more. Lord, we want to make you known to more people around us. For my part for doing that, I'll say this. Uh, Next week, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. First book of the Bible. And what's the whole point of Genesis? To know God. To know God. I have a commitment to you this year. We're going to go deeper in prayer and have more times of worship and prayer, one of the things on our new church property that I've talked to a couple people about. We've chipped up a whole bunch of trees and there's all these chips. What are we going to do with them? I want to make a prayer path around the property. I want to ask you, when we get that built, will you just once a week go on a little prayer walk around that property and pray for our church, pray for every single neighbor around that church? Wouldn't it be incredible if that entire neighborhood came to Christ? Not just because... That's my neighborhood. I love that, right? Yeah. Brothers and sisters, do you want to know God?